I said, one life, one moment, and one voice, I would say that those three simple phrases would all shape the word reset, right? They would all inform and frame the word reset. Because if you have you know, lots of moments, and if you have what you believe is a really long life, and if you have what you believe is lots of opportunities to speak up and use your voice, then you don't really need to reset in the same way. But if you feel like you have just one moment, one life, and one voice, then a reset just has so much more weight and significance to it, and you, you kind of place yourself in pressure in some kind of way, and you think, well, that reset is significant, right? Now, there are all sorts of resets that take place in our lives, right? I mean, today could be a reset, this week could be a reset, I certainly hope it is. Uh, today could be the, the transformative reset that you have in your life. We, we all experience those, and we have them in small and large scales, and they are from internal and external factors. Um, depends what type of year it is. It could be your tax season. I remember, for me, every time tax season comes along, um, I feel like there is just this epic reset in my life <laughs> where I say to myself, due to internal and external factors, right, that uh, I will be more organized next year uh, for my taxes. I will make sure that I will keep every single receipt and I will file them all in advance and I will create you know, meticulously beautiful color-coded spreadsheets that will just explain everything and I will file earlier and earlier and earlier because I just want to be ahead of everything, right? And this is what causes those internal and external pressure points in our lives that we want to be able to change that and that reset happens inside there. Or maybe when you go see the doctor. Um, I actually have a, a pretty phenomenal doctor and, and phenomenal nutritionist as well and uh, I went to see them recently. And when I say recently, you know, as a pastor, when we say recently, that could be last week, it could have been yesterday, it could have been 10,000 years ago. I mean, you have no idea, right? <laughs> it's just uh, our storytelling ability that we have. So I recently went to see my pastor. Uh, not my pastor, my doctor. Hmm, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Now you know there's something weird about the story, but, well, let's go with it. <laughs> so I went to see my doctor, and uh, here, here's what happened. Um, my doctor said that I should go see this nutritionist, and she's incredibly gifted, incredibly talented. Everybody wants to go see her, so I sat down with this nutritionist. And uh, second session, I came along to see her, and uh, the second session, she asked me how I was doing. And I said, you know, well, it's, it's going okay, you know, I'm... I'm I'm doing, she asked me how I was doing on the intermittent fasting, and I said, well, it's intermittent. Uh, <laughs> it's not, it's not, as, not as regular as, as it should be. And, uh, and then she stopped, and she said, um, you know, this morning, before, uh, before I met you today, I, just, I had this impression about you, I was thinking about you, and I thought, man, if, if, I've got to tell Japheth this, that if he doesn't make changes in his life, if he doesn't reset his life, I mean, it's going to be fatal for him. And I was like, whoa, that was very dark. Um, it's very scary. But I'm not really scared by that kind of stuff. And so I was kind of like, Meh. yeah, well, we'll just keep on, we'll keep on working some stuff out, right? So then I went and saw my doctor. And, uh, and um, <laughs> I was talking to my doctor, and he was asking me how things are going. And, and I found out, unbeknownst to me, that they talk. <laughs> Go figure, that they collaborate and they talk because the doctor said to me, you know, um, we love you, we, we care for you. And I'm like, and I actually do believe that they really do. And, uh, and he said, we love you and we care for you. And you know, people are motivated by either fear or love. And I was like, oh, that's, that's what happened. <laughs> she was... Good cop, bad cop. It was like she was like pushing me on the fear side, and now he's pushing me on the love side, and they're, they're trying to reset me. <laughs> and they're both playing at this thing because they care for me in their different ways, and trying to find what motivates me to make the reset that I need in my life drastically to make in my life. And I was like, oh, and I was just, just not happy, not happy about what was happening in the sense of I wasn't happy about the whole love fear idea. In fact, I really didn't start to listen to anything he was really saying because all I was doing was thinking about, is it really 
love and fear. Is it really, are those the two motivating factors? And that's where my mind went to. He was talking and it sounded like Charlie Brown at that point, like, you know, in the school teacher speaking, and I wasn't paying any attention because I just like, could it really... Could we really be motivated by love and fear? Are those the only two things? In fact, after that visit, I went and did a whole stack of research into the origins of the idea of love versus fear and Machiavellian and Shakespeare. And I went, oh, I could, do, I could speak about this for hours. <laughs> right? It is interesting, and it is an entirely different world, but it is interesting to see and to consider what is it that motivates us and what drives us. You know, for God... God actually wants us to be motivated to reset ourselves by love. And actually, love, God, when he drives the reset, that's actually the truly inspired and really healthy reset that takes place inside our lives. And often we miss that because we think that we are the ones who have to drive the entire reset. But what we need is, is really a great disruption. We need something to kind of just take us off our course a little bit to say something needs to change. That's what causes a reset, either an internal or an external kind of force in your life, a, a factor, a framing that suddenly says, ah, oh, maybe I do need a reset in my life. And, and then God's like, oh, let that be love. Let it be me. Let it be God who drives it so that you can have this reset. And may that reset be a long, steady reset. Um, maybe not exactly what we want uh, because we would like it to be more instant, right? That would be the, the best resets for us. And I know you're thinking we're not always shaped that way, right? I mean, we don't change that quickly. We are, we're very slow at making changes. That's what we are as human beings. We're not instant. We're not about instant gratification. I mean, that's maybe just a modern thing, not just an old thing, right? I mean, because Adam and Eve, it, it, surely, when they were walking around in the garden talking to Jesus about life, it was what? I don't know. Eight o'clock in the morning, let's just go late, shall we? Eight o'clock in the morning, they're chatting with Jesus. How many hours do you think it was before they separated and you know, ended up at the tree again, and munching away, and that whole thing took place? Do you think it was like noon? Do you think it was maybe earlier, mid-morning? Do you think, no? No, you, you, you're probably thinking, oh, it must have been a long day, right? It must have been like maybe dusk, late at night, Surely they wouldn't have just been talking to Jesus like all connected and then switch just like that, right? No, that would never have happened in your mind or my mind at all because nothing's as instant as that, right? Or, or maybe, maybe hmm, the Hebrew children, right? Uh, when you think about them, the Hebrew children, and they, they were in slavery for 400 plus years and they, Moses comes along and under the guidance of God, he rescues them out of Egypt and they come to the river and they've got the Egyptian army behind them and then the miracle takes place and the sea parts. They do nothing, right? I mean, this is, it's just a, a fantastic, epic moment in the Bible. Nothing, I mean, they do nothing in the sea parts. They cross it. They're like, oh my goodness, God is with us. This is just, this is a miracle. I'm just so connected, so thankful. We have been saved from the, the whip seven days a week for our lives. Generations will change from now on. And then how long was it before they were at the base of the mountain? Was it years? Was it? decades, or well, less than 40 days before they were building a golden calf and having an orgy and worshipping somebody else. I mean, it's instant, instant, right? That, that kind of reset just failed right just there. I mean, just, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? I think when we're looking at Bible stories, uh, First and Second Testament, uh, and I have this, uh, this belief and this model that I've used a lot of times, and I'm actually going to refer to it because it's based on that beautiful Lamborghini behind us. Uh, I, I think that we sometimes look at, at models as just as this kind of big picture thing. And I think it's really important to see them as the big picture idea. And I would call that the Duplo in Lego world. That would be Duplo. It's like really big picture stuff. But then there's also the technique, like this car behind me is where it's like lots of little pieces all coming together. When I look at the stories of Adam and Eve, and I look at the Hebrew children, I think there's the Duplo story, but then there's just these little nuances that we, we kind of just wash over sometimes because we don't want to really address the fact that 
a reset can happen so quickly, and we love instant resets. And we, it's just kind of our thing inside us, and that's the, the technic stuff inside there. And it, it didn't end there. It, it continues in the Bible, in the First Testament, multiple stories. Great heroes. Elijah, right? I mean, you think about the story, you read the Duplo story where he's standing on Mount Carmel and fire comes down and destroys the entire altar. I mean, he's just connected to God. I mean, just, it's brilliant. And the next moment, the next moment, he's running away from Jezebel, worried about one person hiding in a cave, just like begging. In fact, it's actually the same cave that Moses <laughs> that Moses went and talked to God. That's where Elijah went to. He just goes and hides in that same cave because he wants to actually engage in God. I mean, he's just desperate to get back inside. He just doesn't know a way out because instant he's trying to be able to sort that out. That's the kind of like technic stuff taking place inside the story. It's just, it's just rich inside there. So resets are very, very common. And they're all through the entire First and Second Testament, all the way through. And they're in our lives as well. And I think we should give people a little bit of grace uh, with resets. You know, I think we should let people understand that you know, not everybody changes as quickly as they'd like to, and some people love to change really quickly, and, and some people, you think that they've made this huge transitional change, and, and, and then you realize that it hasn't lasted that long. Maybe they went on that intermittent fasting for one day, or two, or three, and then they realize that, boy, well, it's rather hard, <laughs> with me? And, uh, and so then we did an instant reset on the other direction. We were like, oh, maybe I should eat. <laughs> Are you with me? It's like, it's just there's, there's a journey that needs to be motivated by a different factor. And it's not fear, but it is love, but it's not just our love, but it's love from God. And it takes this much longer story inside there. Now, if I were to summarize the entire First Testament, which I'm going to do for you in the next four hours. No, I mean really quickly. Um, I would say that it is actually about God dwelling with us and God saying, not only do I dwell with you, but even though you reject me, I have just been chasing after you to help you to come back. And all I want you to do is to come back into the fold so that we can actually live together, walk together in the garden. Jesus comes, Second Testament, and he's like there, and he says, I just want to show you what reconciliation looks like. I want to show you that the Father is love, and I want to show you that one day we will walk together, we will dwell together. So dwelling together is really important. In fact, there's a moment in the Bible, in the First Testament, where, where Jesus says to them, I want you to build me a sanctuary so I may dwell among you. Right? And they love this. They build it, uh, uh, built a beautiful uh, sanctuary, and the Shekinah glory of God came down and filled the entire temple. And, and so then they knew that God was with them. They felt accepted. It's a beautiful moment. But what happened was that they went through all these little cycles, this middle section, where they were like, with God, without God, with God, without God, with him, without him, with him, without him. And constantly back and forth, back and forth in these cycles until eventually they were in exile. And then they're just longing for the Messiah to arrive so that they may be reconciled one more time again and just, oh, have that Shekinah glory in the temple. And just know that they have been accepted again. I mean, this is what they long for. So they're looking for the Messiah. And the Messiah, Jesus, arrives. John the Baptist declares, behold, the Lamb of God. I mean, they're excited about it. But, but their picture of the Messiah and the Messiah who arrives, a little bit, a little bit different, right? And there's a little bit of tension inside there. And the whole gospel accounts tell you this incredible story about it. Even after Jesus dies and the resurrection, and he spends 40 days, we arrive at the book of Acts, Luke's account, uh, phenomenal. Luke writes the, Luke, the gospel of Luke, and then he writes his book one, and then he writes book two, the book of Acts, the second part, basically, of this, this epic story. And he writes in the second book, Acts chapter one, and he tells us that they had gathered together, and they're like, all right, we're ready. So I'm going to read to you Acts chapter one. Let me just find that real quick. I actually put a little marker here. You thought that I just found Acts chapter 1 already that quickly? Well, I put a little red ribbon inside here. It's just an easy way for me to find it. So Acts chapter 1 said this, Acts 1 verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, 
Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Oh, isn't that just beautiful? I just, I mean, they've spent so much time with Jesus. He's talked to them about the kingdom of God is present. That when he leaves, he's going to bring them the Spirit. The Spirit will be with them. John the Baptist was great, but don't worry about John the Baptist. You are going to be greater than John the Baptist. You have so much work ahead of you. There is so many things in this big reset that I love you, that I'm going to drive through you. The world is going to change like you never imagined. And now they say to him, Lord, will you at this time, right now, instant gratification, restore the kingdom to Israel, because I really, um, I'd really appreciate that right now. I think, I think that would be kind of the best point for us right now. We'd be kind of happy about that. And I, you know, I understand this because I read that text and I kind of think to myself, that makes sense. I mean, that's that's what they did, and this is what they did. They they went into this kind of like panic mode, right? Um, and they elect leaders. Uh, they do. They elect twelve disciples again because well, they had to add one more because they had twelve disciples and. They remember that there were 12 tribes and they don't know what to do while they're waiting to decide what's going to happen. They're not quite sure what's going on inside here. And so you don't blame them. Just give them some grace and some flexibility and embrace the fact that this is how they're trying to address their reset. They want to see a result. I mean, that's what you do when you, you go on your instant, you know, instant fasting thing. You want to see instant six-pack like tomorrow. <laughs> You want to be able to see great results tomorrow. Maybe even today would be great, right? And this is what they wanted. They wanted to fill the reset. We, we want that when we commit ourselves to Jesus. We're like, all right, today, reset my entire walk with God. Then we want this kind of like incredible encounter with God every day to just be like phenomenal. And Jesus says, well, it's, it's, it's instant in, in the instant that you have accepted, but but the journey, it's different. It's not what you think it is. It's just there's so much more entailed in all of this. But they're like, well, we've got 12 disciples and 12 leaders. And what do you know? That's what we actually need to do. And so Jesus says, well, no, I'm actually, I'm actually going to tell you a story instead. He, he tells them, I'm, I'm going to build you into more of the rocking chair style story. And you're like, what is a rocking chair style story? Well, when I was a kid... Um, on, in England, uh, BBC, basically the British Broadcasting Channel, had two channels, and BBC One and BBC Two. <laughs> Pretty fantastic, right? Today now, I live here in the United States, and we have, I don't know, zillions of channels, and in England we have loads of channels as well, but, but back in the day, back in the day, it was two channels, and they actually went off at night time, and uh, they were like, it was like this test signal would come on, so you, you knew that your TV was still working, but nothing was really coming through. In the evenings, uh, there would be a, a person would come on. It was actually uh, for the children, and he would literally he would literally sit in a chair and rock back and forth. And it was called Jackanory, and Jackanory was just a story. The guy would literally just take a book like this and and just read a, a story to you. And I would just sit in front of the TV, just like, oh my. That's just so amazing. I mean, the set must have cost the BBC a fortune to have, what, one camera, three lights, and a back wall. And they're like, all right, we've got the whole country now. <laughs> but we'll go to the library. We won't even buy the book. We'll just go to the library and just get one of the books and, okay, just read the story. But the thing is this, is that it was something very powerful about telling a story slowly seeing it, hearing it, and being in that space again, which was very important. The art was inside there. We're not really much about that these days. In fact, it's actually very difficult for us to listen to things that are lengthy. We, we, we tend to want it to be you know, multifaceted. I, I remember when I saw the movie Back to the Future, and, uh, and the guy had, I think he, the actor there, he had, like Michael J. Fox, had a, a future where he had like all these TV screens where it was like 15 channels. I remember as a child watching that thinking, Oh, that's really funny. Nobody will ever have a TV that has 15 channels. That's not the future. That's just really weird. And <laughs> lo and behold, now, uh, when I multitask, I like to have like four or five different screens open and thinking of different ideas. And it's just uh, it's a different world, right? Uh, but there's yeah, something beautiful about a long story. And a reset is actually like a Jack and Nori story. It's actually beautiful. 
It requires imagination and creativity and your engagement and your time and your breathing and your heart and your mind and your soul connected to you because it's driven by God into your life. So Jesus says, look, I, I need you to understand something deep. And I'm going to tell this story through John. John's there as the last disciple. He really is. I mean, everybody's gone. It's like he's walking around a, a graveyard and he can, see, he can see Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're buried. He can see Paul and he's buried. I mean, he can see all the gravestones. If you imagine that there was one graveyard with all of them. And he looks around at the church and he says, I'm, I'm going to go soon. And I need to make sure that I write something, that I tell them, because I, tell, I feel the Spirit is telling me to pen something, to tell, to tell them a story that will help them reset their lives all the way through to the year 2017 and 18 and 19 and 20 and beyond this year, 20. I mean, and move us forward. That's what he's saying. He says, I need them to look forward into the future. I need them to write something that will take them through. And John writes the gospel of John, right? Um, it's powerful. It's beautiful. He's like, well, I, I've, I've seen what the, my brothers wrote, and I'm going to pull some pieces from there, but I'm, I'm going to pull pieces from everywhere. I'm gonna, I see what Paul's written. Oh, my, so rich, inspired by God to say so much, to reveal so much about who Jesus is. I mean, Paul's the one who, who changed the Shema to include, you know, Jesus. So it was, so they understand the Trinity was deep, that God, the one is two, and I mean, three, and eventually just, it grows. It's just this powerful, beautiful, palpable things that has taken place inside the Bible all the time. So John writes in pens, and he writes the Gospel of John. He writes the book of Revelation. And in Revelation 13, he tells us, before the Lamb, before the creation, the Lamb was slain. He says, before all of this began, Jesus knew, and he made this plan. He made this story, this long story, and he's part of this story, this reset. The reset of the universe, not just your life. It's because he loves us, and he's done this part of this reset. And it's going to change and affect us right to this day. And then he tells us in John chapter 16, again, I've got a little marker here, so it's really easy for me to find, which is really great, but, but this is pretty fantastic, and uh, it's pretty amazing. John chapter 16, verse 31, he says this, uh, in the world you will have tribulation, he tells them this. This is the words of Jesus, as John's penning these words, telling them about the last moments that Jesus had with his disciples before the cross. But take heart, he says, I have overcome the world, Right? And they're like, you've overcome the world? Well, hang on a second. A few chapters down the road in Acts, they're going to be turning around saying, is it now? Are you now going to take over the kingdom? He said, I have overcome the world. I, come there, I came down here. I have overcome the world. And John's saying, you and I, we didn't get it. We didn't understand what was the big story. But as he's rocking in his chair, he's saying there's something about love that God has been doing and working inside, a reset that has changed so much. Despite all the pain and struggles, there's something beautiful taking place. I was in John chapter 12, verse 31. There's this little great conversation that, like a Duplo conversation, we're just thinking we read it and just like fly over it, nothing really significant. It's pretty powerful. It's pretty darn amazing. It says this, Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Jesus is saying that he is looking into the future. He's looking into the moment. He says, who's the ruler of this world? Satan. Satan's ruling the world. When he stood there, Jesus stood in the temptation moment, and Satan said, I'll give you this planet. It's because he had control over this planet. He used to go into heaven and say, I run this planet. They owe they, um, their allegiance to me. I have this planet. And Jesus says, I am coming back to take this over, and I'm going to cast them out. What happens is that at the ascension, at Jesus, Jesus dies on the cross, he resurrects, he goes to heaven. Revelation chapter 12 and chapter 5 all kind of break this down, but it starts in Ephesians 1 verse 20 where it begins where Paul starts to say, man, there is one who has been given authority. 
given authority and dominion and power over all. I mean, this is just like you kind of get goosebumps when you start to see all the pieces come together inside here. And then in Revelation chapter 5, John is like really just, I can kind of feel like he's, he's got his pen, right? And he's just, he's got his pen and he's just like in the inkwell and he's just writing stuff and he's just electric, <laughs> As he's describing with just joy, an ecstatic joy, as he says, there's this scene in heaven and the Father sitting on the throne and he's saying, who is worthy to sit on the throne with me and to take the scroll? Because in the ancient days, whoever grabbed the scroll was the one who had authority. And the Father would give the scroll to this one and the person who grabbed the scroll would be the one who would read the scroll, the, the scripture, the law, and say, all right, I'm now king, <laughs> I now rule. Right? Who is worthy? And they all turn around and say, who is worthy? And Jesus comes and he says, I am worthy. He grabs this and he, he takes a scroll and oh my goodness, you can, you can see the kind of electric joy that's taking place in heaven. Then there's war in heaven. Revelation chapter 12. Then Satan's cast out because that's what it says in John chapter 12 here. And that's where he pushes out the ruler and he says, it's over. I'm, I'm coming and I'm taking, this story is beginning. That's when Satan is mad, not at, at a church. He's mad at people who have scattered this remnant. They are all over the place. These people who are just faithful to God, who are asking God to reset their lives every day. You say, I, I need to be connected to you. And these people, oh, man, they are, they're just... A joyful people, they're happy people, and but man, they're in they're in trouble all the time as well. They're just like in kind of this test, this this tension all the time. But they're in, in constant reset because of the love of God inside them. That's who the dragon's actually upset with, and he's chasing them around like crazy because he just knows his time is limited, which is what the story of Revelation is all about. That we have this one voice, this one moment in time where we get to speak with clarity. And no, our resets are important, but they have to be driven by Jesus. G.K. Chesterton uh, wrote this quote, um, and uh, I'm going to read this to you. It says this, uh, Jesus promised his disciples three things, that they would be completely fearless, not driven by fear, right? That they would be absurdly happy, Right, which is all the Sermon of the Mount is just driving underneath and in constant trouble. <laughs> you love that? Completely fearless, absurdly happy, and in constant trouble. Well, that reset life is not an easy reset life. That's a, a reset journey. And that actually is a long journey. It's a life journey. But it cannot be driven by an action that we just take. It's only driven by love that comes from God, that dwells inside us. And that's what this whole book of Acts was all driving towards and what John was penciling in his letters and the gospel and the book of Revelation and what the whole Bible is driving to is that God says, I want to dwell among you. I want to walk among you again. I want you to walk among me and be with me as well. I encourage you to accept the joy of the reset journey, but it is a journey more of a rocking chair, gentle journey. But remember, with a journey, there is incredible no fear, absolute happiness, and constant great trouble. <laughs> and in that trouble, we'll have Jesus by our side all the time. God bless you, love you, look after each other. Amen.